ganz in Ende. Okay, muchas gracias, buenas tardes. Como profesor David McDermott, uh, yo soy de Nueva Jersey, la grande estado en, en Estados Unidos. <laughs> And, uh, yo hablo español, pero yo, yo hablo, yo, yo, yo no tengo mucho tiempo, so yo hablo inglés mucho más rápido que español. O sea, si yo voy a continuar mi discurso en, en inglés. Okay, I'm going to talk about, um, real quickly, the greenhouse effect is the basis for global climate change, the chemistry and physics of it, relationship between carbon dioxide concentrations and temperature changes, economic impacts, and I'm going to get into this tool that the, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency put together, where I used to work, I worked there for 11 years, um, about calculating your carbon footprint, uh, carbon footprint for individuals and how to reduce your carbon footprint. And um, then I'm going to get into U.S. efforts to reduce global climate change emissions over the last uh, 10 years. And then look at trends both in the world, the world greenhouse gas emissions as well as in the U.S. And, um, and I have a, a list of resources. So for the greenhouse effect, uh, basically what happens is uh, light hits glass. Um, and it hits it at uh, very, uh, various angles, 180 degrees. Um, when it hits it at a non-90 degree angle, the light slows down in glass and it bends and gives off heat. It bends towards the normal and then when it leaves glass, it bends away from the normal and, and then hits the, it hits the ground, bounces back. And there's a critical angle which for glass and air interfaces is 41.8 degrees. So if, if glass hits, I should say the light rays hit the glass coming back from the ground at less than that angle on either side, then it's gonna, you're gonna get complete internal reflection. And that's what causes uh, the greenhouse effect in, in a greenhouse and, and, and also, you know, we've all experienced that in cars, especially in the summertime. The temperature inside a car can get 40 degrees Fahrenheit higher than, than the outside temperature. And in the United States, at least 50 children die every year because of this. Because parents, irresponsible parents, leave their kids in the car to do an errand, and within 20 or 30 minutes, these kids die. So this is, this, we've all experienced a greenhouse effect. Well, in a similar way, in global climate change, carbon dioxide is responsible for about 81% of the effects of global climate change. And so you got to look at the structure of the molecule. Here's a simple molecular structure, but in reality, if you look at it under an electron microscope. You get clouds, of probability clouds for electrons. So this, the single bond is, is generally located between, the electron cloud is located between the atoms. But the pi bond is like a solenoid, and it goes around the sigma bond. And so carbon dioxide, the molecule, almost acts like three panes of glass. And so the light is bending, and, and it going, as it slows down through these electron clouds, and it's giving off heat, and it's absorbing, and then that heat is re-radiated re uh, back to the ground. So if you look at the physics, you have solar flux coming in at 343 watts per meter squared. About 49% gets absorbed in the ground. That's about 100 and 168 watts per meter squared. But 103 gets reflected off the atmosphere back into space. And the key amount that's involved in global climate change is the difference, which is about 240 watts per meter squared kind of bounces, it gets absorbed by the greenhouse gases, re-radiated back to the earth, comes back, gets re-radiated. So that's what's, that's what's causing the climate to heat up. And then if you look at the relationship of carbon dioxide and temperature changes, it's clear, this, this goes back 400,000 years. This data comes from uh, examination of the ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica. Some of these ice cores are more than a mile thick. And so when going back 400,000 years, you see the, the blue is the temperature change and the red is the carbon dioxide. And you see almost the one-to-one -one is a little bit of a lag. 
but it's almost a one-to-one -one relationship, and their concentrations have never been higher uh, than they are now. You can see, maybe this is up to 300 parts per million of CO2, but then when you go to a smaller time interval, going back to 1880 when the Industrial Revolution was just picking up, you see an increase in the rate of change, and now we're up to, this is um, a little past 2000, we're up over 400 parts per million right now. And this is another, another graph, a similar, similar one. This is from the U.S. National Geographic and Atmospheric Administration. Okay, and the economic impacts, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of um, atmospheric models to, to showing what the impact, uh, the unit impact of CO2 emissions, uh, the cost per ton of, of, of CO2 emissions. And it ranges, um, various models range from $21 to $120 per ton, with a median of $51. Well now, in, in the U.S., where we're, we're doing a, a better job of calculating that damage um, from the increase in, in both the intensity of storms and frequency of storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, droughts, uh, damage to, to crops, fires, floods. Um, it's, it's, in 2017, um, the Federal Emergency Management Association estimated we had about $300 billion in actual climate change costs. And greenhouse gas emissions about 6.3 billion tons. That's from the World Bank, and that comes out to be about 50, to 47 dollars per ton of CO2. That's a that's a 300 billion dollar tax, basically, on, on American citizens. Um, so the cost per capita is a little over 900 dollars, given our population is at almost 327 million. Um, and specifically in New Jersey, how the, how the, the, the industry is at risk, we have a, a huge, we have 120 miles of shoreline, so we have a huge tourism uh, economy of 44 billion a year, um, which supports 500,000 jobs. Uh, commercial fishing is an $8 billion industry, and that supports about 50,000 jobs, and then we have agricultural damage as well. So the, the carbon footprint calculated, now this is a, a workbook in Excel, and um, this is, this is a, I'm just presenting a summary. It's pretty complicated, and, and if people want, I can send it to Elaine and you can distribute it to everybody. But uh, basically, it goes through various sources of greenhouse gas emissions on a, a household level. So you look at electricity, tra whoops, what am I doing? Electricity, transportation, heating, and that, this is more applicable in, in northern climates. Wind, window panes and um, heating, and it basically the, it has various assumptions on the average uh, size of house in the U.S. is 2,000 square feet. The average amount of energy used uh, per month is uh, 943 kilowatt hours per month, um, and then also it, it actually gets into how the electricity is generated. So you know, if you're generating if we, in Northern Jersey, we generate it by burning garbage. And so that tells you how many pounds of CO2 are generated per kilowatt hour of electricity used um, in the average person's per home. Uh, and then for cars, it talks about the average number of miles driven, average miles per gallon, pounds of CO2 uh, equivalent per car, um, and heating it gets you to the pounds of, uh, it, it assumes you're using natural gas, which most Americans do use natural gas to heat their, their houses. Um, but in the interest of the time, I'm just, I'm just going to move to the next slide. And, the, all those, and you actually can change the assumptions. That's, a, that's the beauty. You can change the assumptions because different parts of the United States uh, use different uh, uh, types of fuel to heat the houses. And uh, there's other, you know, there's different changes, different climate conditions. So, uh, so you can get specific uh, to, to where you live and down to your zip code. Whoops. Okay, then, then uh, also, you know, it looks at major appliances, it looks at temperature of both your heating systems and cooling systems, and waste, solid waste generated, whether or not you recycle it or not. And kind of the bottom line here is it shows that the average uh, American household generates 19.5 tons of CO2 equivalent per year, and that comes out about almost 11 tons of CO2 per person per year. So if people, implemented all of these various uh, ways to reduce their personal uh, emission, uh, global climate emissions, if you multiply that by our population,
that reduces the amount of CO2 emissions equivalent in half. It's about a 50% reduction. So that's so that, you know, we don't always have to rely on government policies because we don't always have good government policies. We don't always have the president that we wish we had. So, uh, so even despite that, everybody can have an impact on reducing global climate emissions. So now I'm just going to go through uh, real quick the uh, trends in world greenhouse gas emissions. This comes from, this is 2011. China is at 20%, now it's at 30%. The United States is about 15% of the global climate emissions. The Europeans are about 10, and followed by India at 6%. So I got some other slides that'll show you uh, what's happening in all various continents of the world. The major uh, global climate gas is carbon dioxide. It's about 81%, followed by methane and nitrous oxide and hydrofluorocarbons. And as far as the industry, that industry is generating uh, world greenhouse gases. Energy obviously is the number one, um, followed, by trend, followed by agriculture, then industrial processes, waste, land use change, like deforestation. That, the biggest problem with that is in Africa, where there's a lot of deforestation in Sub-Saharan Africa, because they use wood to cook. That's a, that's a problem not just for global climate emissions, but also for particulate matter, which fewer speakers have talked about. And then it shows you just the trend since 1990. The Europeans have, have done a good job reducing their global climate emissions. The United States has too, especially since 2008, um, right after the Great Recession, and then when President Obama came in, our emissions are down 10%, almost 700 million tons of CO2 since 2008. Um, most of the other, let's see, this goes through Australia, Africa, Latin, Latin America. Um, there's not too much change in those areas, and there's not much in the way of global climate emissions. But look at Asia. It is out of control here. This is mainly because of China. China's now at 30% of global climate emissions in the world. All right, then this is uh, for the U.S. Uh, this just shows, shows the breakdown of greenhouse gas emissions mostly carbon dioxide, and that, that is coming down since 2008. Yes, yeah, 81% greenhouse gas emissions from carbon dioxide. Um, our industries, our electricity generation is only about, it's, it only generates about 30% of our global climate emissions. Transportation is much bigger, because we use, that's three, okay. <laughs> Transportation is much bigger because we use a lot of cars, in the United States, almost everybody's got a car. So, followed by industrial processes, and then, then agriculture, commercial, residential is the least. And you can see the breakdown here, 30% electricity, 26% for transportation. That's much higher than other parts of the world. And then it, our industry is um, probably about, probably similar to uh, other parts of the, of the industrialized world. Our agriculture is only 9%, so it's much smaller uh, than other continents. This shows you the total greenhouse gas emissions per uh, CO2 equivalent. So it shows you since about 2008, we've come down about 700 million tons a year. Um, and just to get uh, an idea of how bad this is, there's three towns in the U.S. that are currently being abandoned because of sea level rise, two in Louisiana and one in Alaska. Um, and there, there is a sea level is threatening 1,400 U.S. cities, especially on the East Coast, where the sea level is rising three to four times faster than the rest of the world. Um, now, the good thing is, thanks to a couple, a couple different things, the increase of natural gas production in the United States from fracking, and, and also the regulation of methyl mercury, which is uh, predominantly all the metal, methyl mercury in the environment, almost all of it comes from coal burning. Because of that regulation got passed in 2010 under the Clean Air Act amendments, 25% oops, 25 of all U.S. coal plants have closed down in the last 10 years. That's 150 plants out of 600. Um, and that trend is continuing, which is very good. Um, then, it, okay, where we're at right now in the U.S., in 2016, our total installed electric generation capacity was 1,074 gigawatts. 
we added 28.5 gigawatts of electricity generation infrastructure in 2017, so almost 3%. Of that, wind and solar energy accounts for 98% of the new U.S. generation capacity in 2018. Almost all of the new generation capacity is, is, in the last few years has been through renewable sources. That, the, the other 2% is from natural gas. And um, now, renewable energy capacity in the U.S. has reached 20.4% of the U.S. total, so it's over 200 gigawatts. Uh, that's more than anywhere else in the world. And in almost half the states are Democratic governors who represent probably three quarters of our population. They're establishing renewable energy portfolios with goals to reach, including the new governor in New Jersey, to reach 100% clean energy generation by 2050. And so if you include nuclear energy, was we generate about 20% of our energy from, from nuclear, and there's no greenhouse gas emissions from nuclear. So we're right now we're at almost 40% of our, a little more than 40% of our electrical energy generation is from clean, uh, zero greenhouse gas emission sources. That's over 400 gigawatts of energy. Am I out of time? Is it one minute? Oh, good. Because <laughs> I skipped the slide. Okay, this is, this is, I, I skipped this slide, efforts to reduce global climate emissions. One other thing that, that President Obama did was he raised the, the comprehensive water fuel efficiency standards in the United States to from 25 to 35 miles per gallon. So as of 2016, our, the average fuel efficiency uh, for American cars and light trucks is 35 miles a gallon. It's going to increase to 54 and a half by 2025. That, is, that has reduced our usage of, of oil by 3 million barrels a day. Just from that, um, I talked. Okay, I talked about that. Uh, we're, the EPA under President Obama also promulgated ambient air quality standards under the Clean Air Act for CO2 for carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from electric power generation, which is our number one source of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that'll force power plants to reduce those emissions by. 30% by 2030 as compared to 2005 levels. And I'm not even going to talk about the Paris Climate Agreement. <laughs> We're still in it. It's, it's a process. And we have like four years to get a new president and get back to the accord. But right now, most of our Democratic governors, almost all of our cities are run by Democratic mayors, and they are all complying with the, the Paris Climate Accord. We have a distributed government. And the president has a lot less power than he thinks he has. And uh, thank you for your attention. Oi.
basically goes out to the salt caverns in the state of Utah. That's where all the level radiation in the United States goes. Um, and it's, it's very, that's very stable geology out there. There's like no seismic activity pretty much, so it's pretty safe there. The high level radiation, um, nobody wants it. Nobody, nobody wants it in their backyard, so that's, that is a problem, it hasn't been solved. We tried, to, different, different government administrations have tried to create a site out west where there's a lot of land and not a lot of people. And even so, even, even people hundreds of miles away do not want to, people driving trucks with high level radioactive waste through their neighborhoods. Other questions? Maybe one from my side, if I can. Uh, so what you all say, if I understand well, despite the decision, current decision of, the, of your administration, the trends that you showed up to 2014 would still continue to decrease in greenhouse gases, despite the promotion of coal, for example, by your by less environmental friendly decisions that we hear. You see the trend continue like this. Uh, what, you, what you're saying is um, the, the economics are taking over. I mean, it's almost, you don't have to regulate, you almost don't have to regulate this anymore in the United States because the price of natural gas, wind and solar, are down to four cents a kilowatt hour. So they're way cheaper than coal. Coal now is, is the most expensive form of electric generation um, because, well, for a couple of reasons. One is the regulation of methyl mercury. Because methyl, methyl mercury, almost all of it comes from burning coal. It's, it's responsible for all the mercury in the environment, and it's one of the leading suspected causes of autism. And in the United States, it's, I don't know about what the statistics are in the rest of the world, but one percent of our children are being born with autism now, and that, that, and you know that is that's a problem that someone is going to have to solve because you know I, I know personally some some people that have an autistic child. And it's like, what's gonna, I, I think, oh, what's gonna happen when their parents pass away? 